uh, with me today is Michelle Reyes, uh, Ray Chang, Ephraim Smith, John Richards. We're going to have a great conversation and introduce yourself as we go. And Michelle and Ray, we're going to start with you. We thank you so much for the robust work you've done on the AACC statement. You'll talk about that, the Asian American Christian uh, Collaborative on Facebook. Uh, almost 10,000 signatures now to a statement you made several weeks ago. Uh, but we're going to start there. Michelle, tell us about yourself, Ray, and then we'll jump right into that statement and some of these issues. Well, hi, uh, everyone. Thanks for having me, Mark. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Michelle Reyes, and I am the Vice President of the Asian American Christian Collaborative. And I am a church planter along with my husband, a pastor's wife down in Austin, Texas. We planted Hope Community Church, which is a minority-led multicultural church on the east side, um, working primarily with an immigrant community. And um, yeah, but, uh, you know, my bylines, author, speaker, activist. Uh, I have a forthcoming book with Zondervan on cross-cultural relationships, and uh, I'm also the local CCDA networker for Austin. So. Uh, just glad to be here and talking about a topic that's dear to my heart. Yeah, and also the vice president, I think, of the Asian American Christian Collaborative, right? Didn't I see that? Yes. And as part of that, I'm sure, uh, and we'll talk about this, uh, one of the people who helped form that statement, that important statement as well. Ray, tell us about yourself. Yeah, my name is Ray Chang. I am the president of the Asian American Christian Collaborative, as well as a, a campus minister at Wheaton College in Illinois. Uh, for anyone who's looking to send their children to a Christian liberal arts college, send them our way. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the Asian American Christian Collaborative is a uh, kind of a Christian collaborative that's by, for, and about Asian American Christians. And what we hope to do is create a space where uh, Asian American realities are highlighted, especially Asian American Christian realities from a Christian perspective, a historical Christian perspective uh, that's deeply grounded in orthodoxy. And, uh, and we're really glad to be here. Well, it's great to have you guys. I'm uh, getting on the Facebook page right now because we've got uh, some people chiming in. They want to be known, heard. Christopher, we're glad to have you with us today. Uh, Ken Barnes, Kelvin Ricks, Josh Clemens again, John Brown the third, Jim Smith, Jeff Coleman. So glad to have each and every one of you with the call. And by the way, this is live. So if you have uh, comments, thoughts, questions for our guests today, please make sure you chat them on the Zoom webinar or in the Facebook comment section. We'll try to get to those uh, throughout the morning uh, as we go. So, uh, and since we're making introductions, why don't we do that? Ephraim, uh, John, introduce yourselves and then we'll begin the discussion. Ephraim Smith, and uh, I uh, am the co-senior pastor of Bayside Church Midtown in Sacramento, California, also a co-owner of Influential LLC, uh, a, a ministry company that's about influencing reconciliation, transformation, and justice. And um, Ray, tell us about your sister reality. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and that, that echo is just other things that I would say about me that I don't want to say in my own voice that angelic voices would say about me. And so with that, I'll turn it over to my brother. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ephraim. I'm John Richards. I am actually the former managing director at the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College. So Ray and I are colleagues. We've had several cafeteria conversations around this very subject. So I'm excited about having that conversation with you all. Currently, I'm a pastor of assimilation down here in Little Rock at St. Mark Baptist Church with uh, Pastor Philip Pointer. So Happy to be on the call, Mark. Well, we're so honored to have each and every one of you. Woodson Walker, Robert Irvine's here with us, Randy Levitt, Yancey Brown says hello, and my good friend Christopher Harris from Tampa at Crossover with Tommy Kylonen. Well, let's get into the conversation if we could. And, and Michelle, let's start with you. Um, first, talk to us, if you would, about um, the need for the statement. Tell us about the Asian American uh, Christian Collaborative. Uh, why that was formed, and of course, take us to the statement at the heart and, and behind the scenes of why the need for that statement. Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, so the Asian American Christian Collaborative, uh, you know, it feels like we've been around for a year, but it's about three weeks, three weeks old, and um, we are an organization by, for, and about Asian Americans. And um, so we, Ray and I and, a, and a, a, some friends across the country, uh, Asian American Christian leaders across the country put together a statement on anti-Asian racism in the time of COVID-19 and that was released on March 31st and we uh, we were 
compelled to draft a statement to condemn the rise in overt anti-Asian racism in the United States. Um, and it was, it was a call out to the church uh, as well as society. Um, and it was, it, was, it was to call out racism, but also for our fellow Asian Americans to feel seen and, and heard. And, you know, par part of the reason why we did this is, is, is because uh, to dispel th this, this myth or this idea that what's happening right now against Asians is an isolated event or that it's, it's not connected to any sort of systemic history of racism in the United States, um, which, which is not true because racism against Asian Americans have existed for centuries and Asian American immigrants and laborers have been demeaned and marginalized and physically assaulted since they first arrived in the United States uh, back in 1587. And in fact, the largest mass lynching in American history was the Chinese massacre of 1871 in which 18 Chinese men were attacked and murdered in LA. And so you don't hear about this in most history books and no, nor will you learn about the history of anti-Asian policies in this country. For example, the, the, the president's uh, recent order to suspend immigration is all too familiar as Asians uh, were banned from entry to the US in 1917 on the grounds of illiteracy. So COVID-19 related violence is just the most recent iteration of racism against Asians. And as this pandemic continues and the contagion of anti-Asian racism grows, there's a real physical threat uh, to people's lives. A woman in California had acid thrown on her face. Uh, a Burmese family here in Texas was physically assaulted. Um, another person has been stabbed. And we put out the AACC statement because we wanted to raise awareness to this issue, but also literally to save lives because um, this, this could escalate and get, get a lot worse. So th that was a, a huge reason why we were compelled to do this. We also wanted, as I mentioned, to give space for Asians to feel seen and legitimized for the microaggressions that they're, that they're uh, facing in their lives because many Asians have been spit at, they've been coughed at. Um, just this week in San Antonio, um, a hamburger joint put a, a poster in its window saying, you know, eat, eat only American, don't eat uh, Chinese food. Like those are the sorts of microaggressions that, that Asians and Asian Americans are, are experiencing. People shouting at them to go home, pointing at them. Um, and we're seeing growing research as well of the mental health effects that this sort of racism is having against people who are experiencing it personally, um, as well as witnessing it. So there's, um, for, for even people who aren't experiencing it directly, just the knowledge of these instances um, has, has led to feeling anxious, depressed, um, hypervigilant, and that leads to mental health issues as well. So there's a collective trauma that's taking place in the Asian American community, formed by the anticipation that comes from people of your shared identity having ex expressed uh, or experienced violence. So when we talk about racism right now, and particularly against Asians and Asian Americans, we have to understand its history, the real threat of physical violence, as well as its toll on mental health and trauma. So it's, it's a complex topic, and we're hoping that our statement can begin to address this, and that moving forward, the AACC will, will continue to provide resources on the subject for people. Well, it is a complex subject, but boy, in just five minutes, you broke it down and provided such wonderful information at a broad level. In fact, it's a good time to say that this edited uh, conversation will be posted within 24 hours to the Mosaics uh, Global Network's YouTube channel. So definitely you'll want to go back, review that, and spread, spread that. Help others understand the things that we're talking about today that Michelle brings up. And I'm glad you brought up some of those stories, Michelle, uh, because I think, uh, my, as we talked about before, Often you might hear the sensationalized stories and people might hear those and uh, these ones that really stand out and you think surely that's not happening to the common Asian on the street. But you bring up many, many stories very quickly uh, that this is just the, the, the average daily life, not only in COVID, but even before, but heightened by COVID. Ray, I know we talked about that as well, getting away from some of the sensationalized just to the everyday life. What's it like for Asians? Uh, Michelle brought up some of those stories but what's it like for the average Asian today? Uh, tell us some more about that. And of course, your part in drafting that statement. Yeah, I think you know, no one was surprised when we started hearing uh, about the violence that started to emerge around uh, anti-Asian racism. I think all of us were kind of, uh, or at least the, those of us who were kind of racially conscious, were kind of understanding how race works in America and in society, 
were anticipating that we would start getting targeted from you know months before you know the 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 re research and the report started coming out. Um, I think generally the most common experience is is a fear of just being outside and because we don't know who's going to target us and who's not going to target us. That doesn't mean that everyone gets targeted similarly or unanimously, but uh, it just comes up so randomly. So the first time I went out after uh, self-isolating, I went to Walmart and I had two women, they happened to be white, point at me and say, there's another one. And, you know, racism against Asian Americans is oftentimes undetected and goes and flies under the radar because um, it's not categorized along the black and white binary. It's, you know, racism against black people is very clear in the, in the United States because it's well documented and there's a clear uh, trajectory of where the racism leads. Racism towards Asian Americans is a little more complex and a little harder to see. Uh, and it usually starts with humor and then it starts and then it leads towards exclusion and, and marginalization. Uh, and so when, when someone said to me, oh, there's another one, I, I looked around and I'm saying, okay, what could it be? And I had to go through this mental checklist and say, okay, is it because I'm a man? No. Is it because I'm wearing a mask? No. There's a bunch of other people wearing masks. Is it because of this or is it because of that? And one of the things I realized was that it was only because I was, because I was Asian American. I was the only Asian in the whole store that I had seen, at least in the, in the lobby area. And so by that time they had already gone. So I couldn't say, excuse me, that was very unproductive in a pandemic. You know, like, can we at least try to love one another in the midst of this global pandemic? So the conversations that, and I'm sure that, and I know that many other Asian Americans have experienced this or even Asians in America who are not American are experiencing this. But my wife and I are regularly having conversations about whether it's worth going out because we don't know if we are going to be targeted for racism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the, the, the most common conversation we have is, 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 is rooted in a deeper fear of being targeted for racism than actually contracting the deadly virus, right? And I think there, there's something lopsided when there's a global pandemic taking place and we're more afraid of how other people might treat us in the midst of this thing that apparently affects all of humanity. And, um, and so there's, there's challenges around that. Um, and then, you know, beyond, beyond, beyond that, I think, you know, one of the things that, that we as Asian Americans are trying to wrestle with is this uh, this notion that we we have been we've had stereotypes imposed on us like the model minority myth and the perpetual foreigner, and the model minority myth basically states that we are good hard workers that are satisfied with whatever station we're given in life that we put our heads down we don't you know stir up any trouble we don't we don't advocate for ourselves. And, and then the perpetual foreigner myth uh, or syndrome basically says that we are constant foreigners. We're always the other. We are never American enough, no matter how American we are, which is why people of Asian descent that are fifth, sixth, seventh generation still feel like foreigners, even though their whole families have never even like seen, um, seen the world beyond the United States or lived outside of the United States. This has been their, their country for for uh, for multiple generations, and what these two things do is one the model minority myth silences Asian Americans, but then the perpetual foreigner syndrome it discounts any voice that Asian Americans have. And so when we speak up about these issues, it oftentimes gets neg uh, negated or downplayed, um, cast aside as as not truly racism and um, and those are things that we were, we're really trying to address. And so when we, when we were writing the statement, we, we had a lot of us who were uh, the original drafters it, had anticipated uh, the racism that we were seeing. And we wanted to create a statement that would be able to help disciple and, um, and, and, and inform and form Christians and non-Christians alike to the realities that Asian Americans were facing. I think the thing that was most, so, kind of uh, formative for me though, through this process is that for the first time in my own life, I could resonate to some degree of what it's like to be black in America, right? It's not the same, but I've never had an issue wearing a hoodie going outside. I've never had problems wearing a hoodie going outside. You know, no one's ever targeting me for my skin color thinking that I was naturally a threat. This is the first time in my own life, even though there have been historical experience, examples throughout the past where Asians have been perceived as a threat, but this is the first time in my own life where I, I physically, viscerally feel like I am a threat to society just by being out in public. And 
this was the first time I knew beyond my head uh, what African Americans and Black people throughout the country might, might in a small way, be going through. Mm. You know, um, I appreciate you bringing that up about the statement and even your own personal experiences, uh, because the statement goes beyond just addressing anti-Asian American racism, right? It does talk about intersectionality in terms of the African American experience, et cetera, and, and that's so good. Michelle, uh, I want to go back to you um, about this, because in part, what I hear Ray talking about is what you mentioned earlier, and that is it's not just an individual personal affront or trauma, but there's a collective trauma uh, right now being felt by the entire Asian American community, uh, this collective trauma. Even if, even if that hasn't happened to you, Harry and I were talking about that, you know, in Little Rock, Arkansas, relative to the percentage of the population and demographics here, uh, we have a very small Asian American community. In fact, I think a week ago, Harry, right, I asked you, I said, have you experienced any of that? Uh, what, when I, I tell people, I asked you that experience, what, what was your uh, response to that, Harry? Yeah, I mean, here, here in Little Rock, it, the population is around four or five percent Asian Americans, but um, I, the, it's, bear, it's here in the deep south, you know, southern hospitality is not going to be overt it will certainly be covert more than anything. But um, when Mark asked me that last week, the only thing I've, I have gotten is just weird looks and stares, you know, nothing, nobody's saying anything yet, at least. I've already formulated in my mind though what I'm gonna say <laughs> if they do say something, but it's definitely a heightened awareness and sensitivity. And actually even, you know, before Michelle speaks, I, I wanted to just say one thing, and that's people probably don't have an understanding of the historical anti-Asian racism that has existed over many hundreds of years since the country has formed. Um, my family came here the first in the 1890s, and there was all kinds of stuff happening back there. The Chinese Exclusion Act, it's just in your face, uh, anti-Asian racism. And I also want to hear from you guys, what, what books would you recommend for people to go back and read on? Because there's so much fascinating history, especially on the topic about to come up on the intersectionality between the Asian American experience and the African American experience. But do you guys have any good references you would recommend for people to go back and kind of catch up on some of that stuff? So if we could, let's hold, I wrote that question down, Harry. Um, I'm, let's come back to that towards the end when we are talking about resources, if we could. Um, but I want to take what Harry said and pull it back to uh, his experience here, your experiences, and again, this collective trauma. So Harry, what, what I heard Harry say a week ago is, and I didn't have language for it until Michelle, you said that, but there's a collective trauma, right? Even if you're not experiencing, as Harry called it, the overt racism, uh, in a personal way, there's a collective trauma. And, and even what Harry's talking about is the past, right? That goes back generations or centuries. There's this heightened awareness in the current deal, but this is a theme, this is a thread um, that didn't just arise with the COVID crisis, right? And that has created both in the past and in the present, a collective trauma. Michelle, talk about that for a moment, if you would. Yeah, sure. Um, and I, I also just want to say that, like, for, for myself, like, experiences of racism have been far more prevalent in my own life um, growing up and even in my, in my, my mom's uh, life as well. So my mom, she immigrated here in the 70s, but she, she was born in an Indian village in Uganda, Africa. She was part of that group of Indians that were brought as forced labor, uh, brought by the British from India to, to Africa to build the railroads there. Um, and then in the 70s, when President Idi Amin came to power in Uganda, and he waged a, a genocide against the Indians there, and they, they literally had to flee their home with nothing, uh, running for their lives. And so, um, you know, that sort of threat of genocide and oppression is part of my mom's life. It's part of the part of that history and experience, you know, that the, the, the study of epigenetics, you know, this is something that's very important to talk about in terms of trauma that's passed from one generation to the next. Um, so it's something that I've carried within me. Um, but then, you know, even from when I was, I was going to be born in South Carolina, my, my mom went to the hospital when she was in labor and these white doctors put her in a room and nobody, nobody wanted to help her. 
And, um, you know, thankfully my dad was able to come off of base. He was an Air Force pilot and was running late. But um, if my dad hadn't made it there in time, my mom would have probably given birth to me in an empty hospital room by herself. Um, and so those sorts of experiences have, have you know, shaped my own life. When 9-11 hit, um, you know, the, the number of people that called my family and myself a terrorist, um, the sorts of uh, physical assaults that, that took place against other South Indians, um, you know, these were my friends uh, and relatives. Um, I've, I've been refused service at restaurants. Um, I've been, my family and my children, we've been refused medical service by doctors that have walked into a room, took, taken one look at us and walked right back out. I mean, um, so, so experiences of racism have been a part of my whole life. And I, I think for, for, for people that have experienced it at that deep of a level, you just, it, it, it lights a fire in, in you. Um, you just can't help but want to fight against that sort of injustice. Um, and so um, that, that, that's just something that, uh, I, that, that I've always felt called to, is to fight against injustice, both for fellow Asians and Asian Americans, but for people of color and, and across the spectrum. And so um, that, that is something that my husband and I were very passionate about doing in our, in our church. And so um, well, there's the fact that ice raids take place across from our neighborhoods, you know, our children have seen ice raids in, in process and, and caring for immigrant families that have been separated. Um, in 2017, after Charlottesville, our church partnered with local members of the Black Lives Matter movement, and we did a sermon series on racism. Um, this past fall with the whole case with Rodney Reed, who's who, uh, a black man on death row who's been accused potentially falsely accused of, of, of murdering a, a white woman, my husband stood alongside black pastors on national television pleading for a retrial. Um, you know, we've hmm. been talking to local jails about releasing, um, uh, you know, nonviolent offenders uh, so, so that they are less exposed to the risk of COVID-19 right now. Um, we're, we're, we are we are passionate about pursuing justice for all of our neighbors um, because this is the model that we see in scripture. Um, we, we, we truly believe that the, the, the term gospel, uh, justice is synonymous with gospel and, and this is the model of Christ that yes, he cares for people spiritually, but he also physically heals people and reinitiates re them into society. Um, how can we not, as believers of Jesus, be doing the same? And so, um, yeah, it's not about just caring for your own house when it's on fire. It's about caring for everyone else's house, too. And I, I think that's something that all followers of Jesus need to be pursuing. Yeah, you know, at Mosaics for years, we've written, we've said that justice is not peripheral to the gospel. It's intrinsic to the gospel. And uh, this is what you're bringing up. And I know John uh, C. Richard, that's, that is, certainly resonates with your heart, your life experience. And you know, this isn't just about Asians, uh, if you're watching today, talking about the trauma that they're experiencing both personally, historically, and even collectively in the moment. But uh, you don't have to be Asian to, be, to understand and to be an ally, if you will. And John, you've been that. <laughs> I know you and Ray have a great relationship, goes back to days at Wheaton, uh, but, but speak into, the experience of Asian Americans from your perspective, your passion for justice in this regard. Yeah, I think I think Ray said something very important that everyone should uh, take heed of, and that's that's about the model minority myth. I think it also perpetuates itself not just in majority culture, but also within minority culture. There are African Americans who feel like Asian Americans are the model minority, and I think this really uh, hit home for some people. Um, earlier uh, last month when we saw the video of an African-American male on a subway spraying an Asian-American with Lysol because he believed the myth about the COVID-19 and he thought that person was Chinese. That tore my heart to pieces because as an African-American watching that video, I saw, um, at least on my social media timeline, the perceived silence of my brothers and sisters who are African-American around calling out that act as something that is not okay. So um, I wrote that on my timeline. I said, we cannot be silent when other minorities are attacked like this because we feel like they're the model minority. I think we, we do that because we don't want to feel like we're not the most marginalized people in our culture. 
And when we feel like that, when we feel like we're not the most marginalized, then we don't get the most empathy. So when people uh, who are of a color, people in Asian American culture go through that, we are silent because we don't want to be perceived as least less marginalized than they are. And I'll say that when I was growing up, I was part of that group because I did not have Asian Americans around me. I wasn't around Asian Americans growing up in rural Georgia, in South Georgia. It wasn't until I moved out to California and went to Fuller Seminary where I got to, got, got to have a chance to be friends with a lot of Korean Americans. My first encounter with a Korean American was a first generation woman and her husband. And as a Southerner, I went in to hug her and knowing that that's a cultural faux pas. Can't do that. <laughs> um, so I learned a lot about their culture and found that there's a lot of parallel things going on within our cultures. The first time I had Korean barbecue, Mark, I thought that <laughs> Big Mama made it back in South Georgia. It was so good. I really enjoyed it. So I said, man, there's so many parallels going on here. And I found out that the truth is that we may have come over here on different boats, but culturally, man, we're in the same boat. And if we're going to be in the same boat, we need to be able to speak the truth to power in these situations where we know that something isn't right, uh, even if we have in the past believed that model minority myth. So I think it's super important for us as African Americans to be able to speak up. But there are still some African Americans who still feel like that this model minority myth exists and there's no need for us to say anything about it. And that's mm. problematic for me. Mm. What a, a great analogy. We all came here on different boats, but we're all in the same boat. And that applies to white people as well, right? We came on a boat and we're here in the same boat, particularly as Christians, not in terms of our experience. I get majority culture and privilege and all that. But as Christ followers, we're in the same boat. And I love what you wrote on your blog, John, that we have a duty, a responsibility as ambassadors of, of reconciliation, of peacemakers, following in the footsteps of Jesus, of, in, of, of recognizing justice being intrinsic, of speaking out, white, black, Asian, brown, whatever you are, we are in the same boat as Christ followers. And we cannot allow politicization, right, and the politics of our times and the disparaging words divide us, but that has happened in our time. And that's what conversations are like this, to try to help us uncover and expose the trauma, the pain of individuals and marginalized people. And then for all of us, including whites, and especially whites, given our place in American history and white believers to stand up against this, even against our own people group in terms of its polarization or politicization at times, we have to speak out on behalf of the marginalized and every voice, every word counts when we're standing up for others, no matter what power, privilege, position you have, every word counts. And we all have to play a role in that as you're talking about. Ray, before we transition to another part, and I wanna to get to Ephraim, of course, uh, it must've been something to put together such a robust statement. I know you're almost to 10,000 signatures, uh, but talk to us about some of this in the statement and the richness of the statement and why you think that's important and what over the last five weeks or so that it's been, uh, what's been some of the outcomes and. Uh, are you encouraged that that statement's come out? Are you encouraged by the support? And, uh, and and from that perspective, how do you think it's made a difference? Yeah, no, I'm I'm extremely grateful for the team that assembled so quickly. I mean, the way it started was uh, a few of us were in a chat together, basically talking about how racism against Asian Americans or Asians in America has been dismissed and minimized. Someone called uh, one of the statement draft drafters. Uh, uh, someone called the 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 conversation around anti-Asian racism uh, basically snowflakey and basically said that, you know, they were minimizing the, the problems that the Asian American community were facing. And it was a church leader at a very predominant and uh, significant, uh, predominantly white church. Uh, and so when we started drafting, it took us like three days to finish it. Um, one of the things that we noticed is that there were a lot of people that came out of all these different places uh, to to basically get on board because they were all experiencing something similar from across the country. But I think one of the things that we were most uh, amazed by was not only the Asian American Christian support, but support from other Christians um, in, in terms of how they've kind of come, come around and rallied around the Asian American community at this time. I think everyone here signed the statement. Um, you know, we had other friends, including like the, the 
presidents of major seminaries all across the country, uh, both very conservative and very liberal, which we were very surprised to see. Um, you know, uh, presidents of Gordon Conwell, Trinity, uh, Fuller, uh, Princeton, um, you know, PSR, Pacific School of Religion, Claremont, uh, and then, you know, or, and, and major institutional leaders, uh, including that of Christianity Today, um, World, Imp, World, uh, World Relief, um, the National Association for Evangelicals, uh, and, and you go down the list, you can see on our website, www.AsianAmericanChristianCollaborative, you'll see a list of institutional signatories uh, that, that signed on to the statement. And we were just really encouraged to see the kind of the cross-racial solidarity uh, around this issue, because one of the things that we were hoping to see is is that they, people would use this to not only have conversations individually, but also to preach from the pulpit, to bring about some changes in terms of education so that people started learning about Asian American history early on and Asian American realities uh, earlier in their, in, their, in their life. Because, you know, like that, I, I had to do my own digging in order to understand my own history. It was really never taught. It was like a day in, the, in, in my 12 years of K through 12, right? And so you can't really talk about the Chinese Exclusion Act or the Japanese American incarceration in just a day or in just two days. It, it, you know, those are really complex issues. And many things that led to that were, were things that need to be uncovered and understood. And I think one of the things that I've, uh, I've, been, I've been seeing these days is that if you actually understand your own history, if you take uh, ethnic studies classes, Asian American ethnic studies classes as an Asian American, you're less likely to experience mental health issues because you understand your own history. And then as, as, a, as a future Wheaton College professor said, if you understand you know, the way that race works, uh, his name is Chuck Leo, uh, and you understand how racism works, you don't end up blaming yourself for the racism that you receive. Right. And so uh, we were excited about things like that. We've seen pastors of large and small churches take the statement and use it to preach on, uh, with, from the pulpit in their, you know, the following Sundays. And then elder boards have taken it and basically read through it, had discussions, some in Arkansas, not too far from you, um, where, where they where they kind of talked through the statement, even though there weren't that many Asians, there might have been one Asian couple, but they knew that if it affected one couple in their, in their church or even one couple within their neighborhood, they didn't want their own church members to, to perpetuate the racism that was going on because of the language that was being used uh, nationally by our national leaders, as well as through the media, through the images, where anytime the COVID-19 virus or uh, disease was, was displayed or depicted, it would always be depicted with an Asian, um, Asian person in a mask, right? Mm -hmm. And so we've been encouraged to see how uh, elder boards have been uh, sending out emails to their congregants, basically informing and highlighting these realities uh, to them. And then, you know, of course, the one-on-one -on -one conversations in terms of discipleship, you know, it, it does get exhausting if you are a racially conscious Asian American who's trying to educate everyone because we're, we're about, you know, somewhere between five and 10% of the population. So for every nine people, there's only one of us. And that's a lot of people to educate. And not everyone in the Asian American community has a, has a robust racial consciousness. And so we can end up doing more harm if we don't understand what actually affects our community and we only operate out of our own individual experience, right? Mm -hmm. And that happens across different communities. Yeah. Well, all of this is so rich and well, well done. I'm so thankful for you all being here and helping all of us to learn and to grow from your own experience, from the collective consciousness experience. Uh, we've got people tuning in live. Uh, Paul Kroger's watching, TC Warren, thank you. E. Paul Allen from over at Transformation Church and my good friend Derwin Gray, Georgia Morris. Seth Martin, a church planner up in Minnesota, right here from Little Rock and St. Mark Baptist. A little shout out, John, for Seth Martin. He's with us. Kelvin Ricks, Nichelle, uh, Cherie Walker is with us. Brett Cockrell, Stephanie Hand over in North Carolina with the United Methodist, good friend. Uh, we're so thankful for all of you. Paul Park, Matt McGue, uh, all of you. Brandon Thomas, Gary Grogan, our friend up there in the Midwest. Thank you so much for being a part. We're going to take some questions in a moment, but listen, Ephraim Smith has been sitting there patient. I don't <laughs> think I've ever been with Ephraim Smith in 30 minutes and not hear him say a word. Of course, you've been very uh, patient and you know we're coming to you, Ephraim, but thank you so much. And Michelle, uh, and, and Ray, all of you on the statement. I just want to say on behalf uh, of myself, my family, our church, 
Mosaic Global Network, thank you so much. Uh, because we know it takes great faith, great courage, and great sacrifice to step out and to open up conversations and to uh, not just put things, statements in writing, but actually go out and defend that and to feel all, like you said, the, the things that come at you from every which direction. Uh, you know, uh, when George Yancey and I started Mosaic Global Network in 2004, uh, we know what that's like. And, you know, of course, we didn't start the multi ethnic church movement, but we helped to aggregate it in its early days. And, of course, faced a mountain of pushback for 10 or 15 years until the time of Black Lives Matter in 2014, when all of a sudden this could no longer be ignored. The conversation of, of diversity and unity in the local church could no longer be ignored by the white majority culture of our evangelical churches. I'm very thankful for the movement Black Lives Matter in terms of raising this a consciousness for the American church. I know there's other issues related to that, but certainly that's been an important part that they've contributed uh, in terms of that movement. So all that's to say is thank you for what you've done uh, with the Asian American Collaborative, uh, uh, Christian Collaborative. And by the way, if you're watching, you're listening, uh, make sure you go to Facebook. Uh, you can go to the Asian American Christian Collaborative, uh, look it up. Uh, you can sign the statement. I think we're right at almost 10,000 signatories. So please uh, log into that, stay in touch with the movement that they are helping to create and generate this understanding and hopefully get us beyond anti-Asian American racism in the future. And certainly all of us as Christian, no matter the color of your skin, your cultural background, we all need to stand for one another, not just uh, for Asian American brothers and sisters, but across all uh, division in this country, speaking out wherever we can against racism. With all that said, I bring in the good reverend, the doctor, Ephraim Smith. Now, Ephraim, you know, we want to talk also in this conversation about some of the anti-Black and, and as Ray, we'll get to Ray again on your blog, where you talk about upstream, downstream in terms of this conversation. But, but African-Americans have a perspective in terms of their relationship with Asian-Americans in past. There's a history. You have personal experience. So Ephraim, talk to us for a moment about that. Open up and share some of the things we were talking about before we went live. Sure. Um, honored to participate. And you know, I will frame what I'm going to say around the question, why hasn't there been more intentional solidarity between the African American community and the Asian community in this moment? Because there should be. I think what my brother John did was, was powerful. It was needed. The, the call out uh, was important because when you are an oppressed people, uh, the last thing that you need to be about is either uh, perpetuating oppression on another group or sitting back silent watching another group be oppressed. But this is a biblical narrative as well. I mean, the people of God came out of Egypt as slaves. They were liberated. And there was a covenant with God made with them. And yet you can see the people that came out of slavery actually practicing slavery in the Old Testament. So you'd go, wait a minute, you would, why would you practice or perpetuate what you cried out to God about and God delivered you from? And so, but the question is why? And so let me speak from my own personal experience and then try to connect some dots real quick. So one, I have to admit that growing up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in my, in my experience, I did not know a lot of uh, what I would say racially, socially conscious Asian Americans that spoke out, that wrote on, that were prophetic activist voices against uh, the racism that the African Americans were experiencing specifically. It, it wasn't until till later in my life. I actually knew Asian Americans who would say to me, why do African Americans complain so much? I mean, why don't you guys just work hard and why don't you just start your own businesses as if we hadn't started any? Uh, so I knew Asian Americans like that. I met Asian Americans who would say to me, your experience is not my experience. I have, I've never been pulled over by the police for no reason. I, I, I haven't experienced the things that you seem to be angry about, frustrated about. But uh, I am so blessed that God would eventually have my life intersect with people such as Sung Chun Ra, Gail Song Bantam, Kathy Kong, Al Tazan, Peter Cha. Uh, and then that revolutionized my understanding 
and, and the intersections that were right in front of me between Asian Americans and African Americans in terms of speaking to issues of justice. Uh, the other thing that I think is important is also just, uh, uh, Ray uh, alluded to this a little earlier, uh, of just some of the tense journeys uh, between segments of the African American community, segments of the Asian American community, such as African Americans grown up in communities where there's white flight, businesses leave, and then you see uh, segments of the Asian American community come into predominantly black under-resourced communities and benefit economically. All of a sudden, it's like, man, I'm looking around predominantly urban African-American communities, and it feels like Asian Americans have more businesses, have more ability to turn the dollar over in my community than I have, which creates tensions. And I think it's why instead of a, a robust practicing solidarity between Asian Americans and African Americans, these issues get bifurcated they get juxtaposed against each other. Because at the end of the day, um, we are, we're in a political climate where everything is racialized. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it just, and it just depends on the month or the issue, which group of color is being racialized this time around. So uh, right now, unfortunately, in COVID-19 season, uh, you're, the, this narrative is being painted that it's a, it's a Chinese virus. And we need to be concerned about these, these Asian carriers of this virus that has halted our economy and our way of functioning as a nation. And yes, uh, everybody needs to speak out against that. I, I was deeply disur disturbed when uh, on, on national, probably global news, press conference after press conference, briefing after briefing, of, of political leaders in power using the phrase Chinese virus and, and that getting, giving permission for other less privileged, powerful people to use it and carry it. Uh, hmm. We need a robust, multi-ethnic, multicultural, Christ-centered army of, of cross-cultural, reconciling, justice-oriented disciple makers that will speak out against racism and racial profiling in all forms, regardless of the package it comes in. Mm. You know, you mentioned discipleship in that. Our good friend Santis Beatty says, this isn't an issue of diversity. This is an issue of discipleship in our churches, in our own lives, to understand the things that you're sharing with us. And we really appreciate your vulnerability and sharing uh, your own experience, uh, Ephraim, as well. And, and, and John, you as an African-American, of course, had similar experiences and really how this came up, and I really appreciate Ray. In fact, uh, after I talked to John, I want to get to Ray on uh, the uh, follow-up blog post you wrote. But after the Asian Americans uh, Christian Collaborative Statement, and of course, I was honored. Uh, Ray asked me to be one of the allies that initially signed. And of course, uh, that was a no-brainer um, uh, to sign that. And I really appreciated the opportunity to do so. But of course, then I advertised that in the five people that watch my social media posts. And uh, uh, but an African-American friend of mine wrote me and he said this, he said, hey, Mark, I didn't want to post. And of course, I had written to encourage people to read the statement, to sign the statement, to raise awareness, to stand as an ally, as it were. But an African-American pastor friend of mine uh, wrote me and he said, hey, Mark, I didn't want to post this on your wall as to take away from what you were trying to accomplish. But this is one of the conversations that's going on in African-American homes concerning how bad uh, Asians have always treated us and I've experienced it myself, but I imagine it's because of systemic racism already existing within the structure of our country, but I just thought I'd see what your thinking was on that. I took that text, sent it to Ray Chang, and Ray Chang was already on it, and he had written this wonderful piece of upstream, downstream intersectionality on all the things like you're talking about, Ephraim, that we're all, uh, we all need that robust to stand up and to speak out against racism in all its forms, and, and uh, and so I appreciate it, Ray. We're going to talk about that blog post in a second, but back to John on this. Again, speaking from this friend who is African American, you felt this as well before. Ray uh, Afrim is bringing some of that up. Talk to us about your experience with that and some of the intersectionality across uh, this way, horizontally between African Americans, Asian Americans over time. 
Yeah. So, so both Ephraim and I have both worked at uh, majority white institutions. And so I want to make sure I'm clear that neither one of us ever purport to be the UN delegate that represents all black folks. Um, that we are definitely not a monolithic group, even within the African American community. And what you heard, Ray, was someone who shares a perspective that other African Americans share. And that is that we have a very different experience in America than Asian Americans do. And so he, he brought up a very clear concern that he had about this issue that uh, many African Americans share. And then on the other side, other African Americans don't share. So I want to be clear that uh, Ephraim and I are not uh, representing every African American in the US, uh, but we certainly are representing a group of people who are seeking to pursue justice in a holistic manner. So we want to make sure that as African Americans, as both men who are Christians and believers, uh, we believe that every individual is made in the Imago Dei, that every one of us uh, deserves dignity, honor, and respect, uh, regardless of the racial category that we're in. So, so for me on the intersectionality piece, I just think that having some clarity around the fact that we have a whole lot more similarities than many people think that we don't have. And uh, pointing out some of those helps to remove some of those barriers because uh, microaggressions happens within the, the African-American community. We say things, some African-Americans say things to Asian-Americans that are stereotypical, that they find from cultural clues that we've gotten from culture at large. So I think uh, one of the things that I always tell people is that proximity always leads to greater affinity. So the closer you are to folks who are Asian American, Ephraim mentioned several people who he met that helped him shape this perspective. Um, many of those folks are my friends too. Justin Fung in DC uh, went to Fuller with him. Aaron Cho is also at Quest Church with Gail Song Bantam. Those are folks that help continue to shape my perspective. So that intersectionality actually happens relationally. And it's very tough for an African-American in a rural community to experience that because they don't have very many Asian-Americans there. So I would just say, uh, continue to look for other resources that we probably will mention later that will help you understand a perspective when you can't tangibly touch a person and see a person in person. Hmm. Well, one of those resources certainly is uh, on the Asian American Christian Collaborative uh, on the blog there, Ray, your post of April 14, Upstream and Downstream, the River of Justice. Talk about that post because I certainly, you know, I, I wasn't aware of that conversation. Uh, and then my, my buddy texted me, this African American pastor, and he said, hey, this is a conversation we've been having in African American community in the homes for a long time. I really appreciate it. When I sent that to you, you were already on it, brother. And I really appreciate that about you. And on top of that, you'd already written a blog you were about to post. So, uh, and by the way, um, before we get to that, and I want you to talk us through that blog post, um, I sent that to this person and he was so appreciative of what you wrote and what you said. And, um, and, and that's the kind of conversation and honesty and openness and transparency that builds trust and does bring together what Ephraim's talking about this this holy multi-ethnic army of people who stand up white, black, Asian, Hispanic against racism in all its forms. So thank you for your response. Tell us about that blog. And that is one of the resources I encourage people to go to on the Asian American Christian Collaborative. Get that blog, read it, uh, the upstream and downstream, the river of justice. Ray, talk to us about that. Yeah, no, thank you both for, for sharing. Thank you all for sharing. Um, what affects one human affects every human. And I think that's, that's something that you know, Martin King uh, really pushed for in, uh, in all of his work in trying to cultivate the beloved community. Um, but I, I do think that if we kind of went back a little, uh, we, throughout history, Asians were oftentimes far closer to blacks than to whites. The majority of our history, we are 
you know, we have more parallel experiences to the black community than to the white community. And <clears throat> that's something that's been lost over the last 40 years, mostly because we've internalized racism by adopting uh, both the, the model minority myth and not wanting to be categorized as blacks. Because, you know, it, there was a time when Asians would be considered uh, black in one state and then white in another state. And depending on your ethnic background and depending on how much of a threat you were perceived to be, <laughs> you would be treated a different way. And so you would have times when Chinese people did not want to be assumed to be Japanese and the Japanese people didn't want to be assumed to be Chinese and then you know, everyone else didn't want to be assumed to be anyone else either. <laughs> it wasn't until like um, the 40s to 60s where uh, the, the, the Asian Americans started, some Asian Americans started realizing that our experiences were much more similar because we were all perceived as, uh, and, and lumped together in, in one category. And so uh, the term Asian American came around, which was um, basically a activist term. It was a term around solidarity because uh, we didn't want to be pitted against other Asian ethnic groups. Uh, and so they wanted to see there to be they wanted to they wanted to see more unity around issues around justice. Uh, but what's interesting is that a lot of the people that were pushing for civil rights at the time, uh, you know, the, the people that you know, helped coin the term Asian American, were also uh, very strong allies with uh, African Americans uh, during the civil rights movement. You know, so you would have um, um, uh, you would have people like. Uh, Yuri Kochiyama, who stood with uh, Malcolm X, um, uh, Richard Aoki, uh, who who was a field marshal, field marshal for the Black Panther Party uh, before he went to the AAPA, uh, and so uh, there was a, a collective of. Asian American leaders that were standing with African American civil rights activists, right? And that's not, that's not a story that's often told. We we also know that you know not only, but then that doesn't mean that there isn't still and there hasn't always been uh, inter minority racism as well as intra Asian racism, right? And we're seeing some of the comments come in. And you know Michelle has a different experience as a South Asian than I do as an East Asian. Um, and a lot of that's actually rooted in colorism, which is deeply connected it's a it's a cousin to to racism and actually it's adopted it's 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 transformed into a form of racism after uh after kind of uh, colonialism and imperialism uh that was perpetuated by by the west and so you wouldn't be surprised if um a lot of asian americans had had conversations with their parents where they said you can't marry outside of your race and part of that's because of uh or outside of your ethnicity even and a part of that's because uh, uh, practical reasons like language barriers, you know, comfort of culture and things like that. But then more than that, when Asian Americans came to the United States with the immigration uh, ban being lifted, um, one of the things that we saw immediately was how white were experiencing the United States in one way and how Blacks were experiencing the United States in another way. And Asian Americans had to make a very difficult decision to not to choose which kind of lifestyle they wanted to choose. Unfortunately, they also didn't have a lot of uh, resources at the time, even though the first wave Asian Americans were highly educated. They came and oftentimes, uh, we call that the brain drain of, of Asian America or Asians in America in the first wave. Um, but over time, you know, we had to constantly choose between white and black, white and black, white and black. And no one wanted to be treated like black people because black people were treated poorly or brown people. And everyone wanted to experience what the white community experienced. And so, uh, we ended up, so a lot of our kind of predecessors ended up moving into black neighborhoods because that was the only place that they could go. And so Ephraim is absolutely right. Um, we went into these neighborhoods because that was the only place we could afford to live. That was the only place that we could go. But then we still wanted to pursue what whites had. And so we would establish businesses, uh, hair salons, uh, liquor stores, grocery stores, and the like, dry, dry cleaner, whatever it is that we, we had. And then we would try to buy a house in white neighborhoods. And that would extract money out of black neighborhoods and put it into white neighborhoods. But most of that was because of systemic racism that we also experienced because we saw the way that Asian Americans were, were treated as well as black uh, African Americans and, and Hispanics and Latinos. And, and so it, it, 
at the end of the day, one of the things that we're, we, were, we, we realized we couldn't get away from was this white superiority or white supremacy, right? That, that was just kind of baked into the system that, that we, we entered into. And so uh, one of the hopes that we, we do have uh, is that we would elevate racial consciousness among Asian Americans so that, uh, you know, one of the things that we, we often understand about race in America is that we have to, we, when we press into the black experience, we also learn a part about our own experience. But then beyond that, you know, uh, we also see the areas in which we are overlapping in our experiences as well as where we're distinct in our experiences, right? Because even if African Americans weren't in the United States, Asian Americans would still experience a different type of racism, right? That would be targeted towards us because of our own makeup. And, and so I'm, I'm grateful for the fact that we're, we're talking about ways to stand united uh, on issues that are near and dear to the heart of God. Um, and, and hopefully we can dismantle this terrible system of racialization uh, through the connections that we make, through the relationships that we have, uh, through the friendships that we develop, through the churches, which are still more segregated on average than the neighborhood that they're in throughout the country, and that we actually picture uh, uh, the kingdom of God in more robust ways. Yeah, yeah I know. Harry had a follow-up question for Ephraim on that, right, Harry? Yeah, Ephraim, I, you know, I wanted to hear your response to, to what you just heard uh, from Ray, because I remember in the 60s growing up, you know, there were very few Ch Chinese in Chattanooga, Tennessee in the late 50s, which is when my parents moved there, and then I was born in 1960. And in probably 1964 or five, when I was at earliest, my first memory was getting called the N-word on a bus on the way home from school by a girl that said, my daddy told me to come and count the number of N's and you're one. And I'm just like, what is an N? I had no idea what, what she was even referring to. And it took 10 years for the, the people in Chattanooga to understand what the derogatory racist term for a Chinese person was, because I got called the N-word continuously in the 60s until 1970s, then it turned to the C-word, you know, and <laughs> I had to go ask my own father what that meant, and he told me under no circumstances would I, should I be allowed to allow somebody to call me that, and from that point on, it became fighting terms, but Ephraim, what's your response back to what, um, to what Ray just said about just the history of how all that has evolved over time. Yeah, well, first of all, I wanna go back to John said that neither myself nor John speak for all black people. And I wanna make it clear, I do not speak for Dennis Rodman. Okay, <laughs> now that that's clear, I also wanna talk about what Ray said uh, when he said, you know, hey, Asian Americans didn't wanna be treated like black people. And, and the breaking news is, Black people don't want to be treated like black people. <laughs> and, and so, and so that, that's the issue, is that in, in this social climate in which we're in, when people still, based on the color of their skin, their, their physical features, their, their accent, their slang, where they were born, uh, we decide who's smart, who's dumb, who should be revered, who should be feared, who can clap on beat, and who shouldn't bother. We, we, we are still in this deeply racialized climate. And, and I think what's important is how do we get to a place, and I wanna go back to practicing solidarity. How do we get to a place where we care about the plight of other groups of people of color that aren't our own? Because I definitely identify with what Ray was saying uh, in terms of, um, the, the perception by a significant segment of African Americans in, in inner city urban communities feeling like uh, Asian American businesses infringed on the African American community's ability to turn the dollar over in a positive way. You know, when African Americans through integration moved into urban communities, there was white flight. Uh, and then eventually there was even uh, upper middle class, upper class, African-American flight. Hey, if I can get out, I'm getting out of this community. Uh, but then uh, in, in recent years, you've seen this again, what Ray referred to in terms of Asian-American businesses uh, that um, 
benefit in these predominantly African-American communities selling products to African-Americans, but not participating in the economic upliftment of African-Americans. And so, and so for some African-Americans, they go, wait a minute, I don't see how you're participating in the upliftment of my people, especially those at the bottom of the social stratosphere, and yet you want me to sign your document today. <laughs> you know, you want me to go online and sign your statement. We need a bigger conversation. Now, I think every African American should sign the statement. I sign the statement. It's an important statement. I just hope that we can still go. When do we get to the moment where we don't have black statements when a black person unarmed is shot and killed, Asian statements when Asian Americans are racially pro filed and Latino, Latina, Hispanic statements when undocumented kids are thrown in cages at the border, we can have truly Christ-centered, robust, multicultural statements where we care about the economic, spiritual, physical uplift, upliftment of all vulnerable, oppressed people. Hmm. Well, this is such a rich conversation, and I know we're right at the top of the hour. We're going to continue for another 20 minutes or so. If you're watching, we're taping this, of course. So it'll be uploaded to the Mosaics Global Network YouTube channel in an edited form, so you won't have to watch all the bantering beforehand, but get right to the meat of the discussion. Uh, Nancy Short says, unity and voice, heart and faith to be ambassadors of cross-cultural, multi-ethnic, Christ-centered reconciliation in and through and beyond the local church. Morgan Lee, the history that Ray is sharing she said, is outstanding. I've tried to educate myself about it, a lot of this, and still don't know half of it. Charles Wilson, church planner up in Richmond, Virginia. We've received some of our training under Ray at Biola in 2016. I'm loving this conversation. Thanks, everyone, for being there. We're going to bring on, in fact, we have Josh Clemens, and Josh, we're going to get to you in a moment. I want to turn our final time for everyone uh, away from the problem to solutions and benefits, right? The solutions and benefits. We're going to talk I'm going to ask all of you for books, resources, uh, whatever at the end, make sure we get that in. Harry brought that up early on. But how do we move from understanding or even educating ourselves about the problem, about these complexities, to practical solutions? What can we do? Uh, and, and I'm going to give that to any of you, but Ephraim or Ray or, or Michelle, where do we go from here? If, if we understand, we articulate a problem, we see the need, what actually can move the ball towards uh, the type of army, as it were, that uh, Ephraim was bringing up earlier. What what can we do? And Josh, after we hear from a couple of them a response, I'm going to talk about what you did yesterday uh, and what One Race did in Atlanta. But Michelle, what what can we do? Where where do we turn from understanding a problem to start moving towards solution? And how do those solutions help and benefit us all? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I, I think we need to start by, by talking about the church. And in our AACC statement, we began by calling this out um, and, and, and pleading for the church to pursue a new path forward. And, you know, when it comes to um, the church pursuing justice and valuing diversity and doing the work of anti-racism, it has to be an entire system change from the top down. Um, and everything should be impacted from what's being preached at the pulpit to the way um, discipleship takes place to so the justice initiatives the church pursues, but it has to start with the leadership. And, you know, we, we all know this, well, you know, racial and ethnic diversity has become trendy for some U.S. Uh, American churches. The, the sociologist, Dr. Michael Emerson, he has found that 70% of all multiracial churches still are led by white pastors. And this statistic goes along with another um, statistic that Emerson has talked about, which is that multiracial churches where white people are in the majority, uh, people of color in those congregations still conform more to white norms than the other way around. And so there's this culture of, of they have to adopt to white ways of thinking uh, and, and doing. And, and when it comes to racial diversity in many white evangelical churches, the thinking is you know, pe they, people of color, have to become like us, right, like white people. And so seldom do many seriously entertain the other way around that um, the option of going to a church comprised of and led by people of color. And so uh, we believe that we will not even begin to have productive and holistic conversations about issues like race and racism in, in the church until things like that begin to change. Mm -hmm. There is some context needed related to that 70% figure.
but that's not to negate some of the problems that people want to assimilate diversity, not accommodate diversity, right? So that doesn't alleviate that. And certainly uh, one of the hits in the research related to the politicization that Ephraim's talking about is African-Americans uh, in terms of their participation in, in multi-ethnic churches dropped from 26 to 21% in the past five or six years, obviously related to the climate we're in and, and people declaring themselves to be multi-ethnic churches, but, but through assimilation, not accommodation, not structural change like you mentioned. So all that's to say is that that percentage is going in the right direction, but it needs to continue to go in the right direction to make the kind of systemic change you're talking about. And you can find that article, we'll post it on the Facebook page, uh, but it's really a summary of his talk on Outreach Magazine. But I do appreciate you bringing that up and, and sharing about the need for us to deal with this at a systemic level, which really is about responsible authority and the leadership, uh, accommodating diversity, not assimilating diversity, and so much more that has been written about and talked about for the past 20 years. We're in a section here talking about how to. So understanding complexity is a problem. How do we move forward? Uh, and what to do. And one of the things that John, uh, you brought out on a blog was of course the importance of speaking up and speaking out. Each one of you have said that in one way or another that we cannot just let these things go by. And I gotta say, I'm guilty at times too because it seems there is so much uh, of this. Uh, every day there are stories and, and not just about Asian Americans, uh, Hispanics, black, but the polarization of our society, the politicization of our society. I, man, if I was speaking out on everything I see, you know, it's like I'd be speaking about it all day. So even in my own life, sometimes I, I'm wondering, when do I speak out and when don't I, right? Um, just because of the sheer flood and the volume of, of, of the problem and the pro uh, problems that arise. So, John, you encourage that, though, and you say, hey, don't hold back. Speak up. It's important to be an ally. Uh, don't let uh, – you, you, you encourage that. Tell us why that's so important as an action step. Why does every voice matter, if you will, and, and the importance of speaking up? And then, Josh, again, to you, what you did yesterday in Atlanta and why? I think uh, speaking up is super important because silence also speaks. When, you're, when you don't say anything about it, you actually are saying something about it. And I think that's a good starting point for some people is to be able to speak up about it. But I also do think that it also, when you talk about how to's, there's at least three things like education is important. Um, and we're going to talk about resources later, I'm sure, but you have to be able to be educated on the topic to be able to uh, properly address it. I also think innovation is key as well, especially during this COVID time where everybody's sheltering in place. Well, there are still some things that you can do now uh, that could help move this conversation forward. Signing a statement. Uh, becoming allies with uh, the collaborative to help them to move it forward. And then, as Michelle said, I think the third thing is going to be institutional change. The civil rights movement was successful because it succeeded at the institutional level. If you don't have institutional systemic changes, then we're just having conversations. So how do we do institutional systemic changes? We look at our nonprofits, we look at our organizations, we look at governments, and we try to figure out to promote racial unity in a polarized culture. We're so bipolar, but how can we be both and individuals in an either or culture? I think that's going to be super important for us. And I know that Josh has been doing some great work uh, in Atlanta, right? Yeah, for sure. Josh has done great work. One race, him and Hazen Stevens. Josh, great time to bring you in about this because literally this just happened yesterday. I believe with some uh, uh, polarizing comments directed towards your mayor in Atlanta. Uh, Josh, real quick, tell us about you, the One Race Movement, and then tell us what happened to the mayor and how you responded in an action step on behalf of One Race and why that was important. Well, first I wanna say it's a privilege to be a part of this conversation. It's such an important conversation. And uh, Ray, we stand in solidarity with you all. We were one of the, the first to, to sign the, the statement there. Um, it, it's, just, it's just a painful hour that we live in. And so One Race Movement, our mission is to teach a city to love regardless of color, class, or culture. We are situated here in the South in Atlanta uh, where racism is most prevalent and has been most prevalent. It's home to the civil rights movement. And so what we have sought to do is to engage the church on this. The church should lead in this conversation and not lag. And what we've seen historically is that the church lags on this important topic. 
And so what we've been doing is resourcing leaders, calling them to speak up and speak out, as John said, um, right here in Atlanta. And so what we experienced here just, just this week um, was the reopening of Georgia. And you know we can debate whether or not that's a good idea or a bad idea, um, but the actions that followed are, are what's important for this conversation. Um, shortly after, uh, Governor Kemp opened Georgia, said that we're gonna open the nail salons, the bowling alleys, and all of these different things on Friday or today. Um, Keisha, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms spoke out and said that this is not a wise decision. Um, even President Trump spoke out and said, this is not a wise decision. But what followed was a racist text message uh, from someone here in the city, they still hadn't, hadn't uh, discovered whom that was, calling her uh, a derogatory term, an N-word, um, and saying to reopen the state. And so what we're, what we're watching is in the midst of this pandemic, is that, is that racism and white supremacy are cropping its head once more, uh, seeking to, to over-empower some and under and disenfranchise others. Um, and so what we've done here with One Race, and we have a history of this, is, is speaking out about it. You know, there has to be someone that's pointing in the right direction, that's saying, hey, these things are wrong for these biblical reasons. Um, and that's what we did yesterday. We spoke out about the evil, uh, the, the evil attack against Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, um, as well as in the past what we've done. And you can visit the AtlantaCovenant.com. Uh, where we wrote a covenant, basically calling leaders and believers across Atlanta to, to, to repudiate, to, to refute the evil of racism. And we've gotten about 500 leaders to sign as well as 5,000 believers. And so it's, it's our reputation, it's our DNA, that's what we are called to do, is to champion the cause of the kingdom, which is a new humanity. And so we're glad to, to add our amen to everyone else's. So in speaking out and posting that statement, did you yourselves get pushed back? But what's been the response to that? And again, back to John's point, all of us would advocate the same thing. Why is it important to speak out on these types of issues? It's important to speak out on these types of issues because, because the gospel, right? The gospel calls us one. The gospel calls us a new humanity. The gospel says that we are to embody Jesus's prayer of oneness. And we stand in solidarity with one another. So if it's an attack on the Asian community, we should be speaking up for our Asian brothers and sisters. If it's an attack on the Hispanic community, we should be speaking up for our Hispanic brothers and sisters, so forth and so on, because we're all image bearers. We're all, we all bear the Imago Dei. Mm. Um, and it's just right for us to be advocates for reconciliation because Jesus, right, was the greatest advocate for it on our behalf. And so, uh, we get to, in turn, become that as well. Um, yeah, and I think there was a second part of that question, Mark, and I may have missed that. No, no, that, that, yeah, for sure. No, you, you, uh, you hit it right there um, as far as that. We've talked about that already. I want to turn our final thoughts to resources, books, how to go around. I want to go around the horn, give everybody a, a final word as well. By the way, while you were finishing up there, Josh, I went out, I posted the uh, stats. Michelle, back to that 70% that stat. Um, it actually was, uh, and I was stumbling before because I just rehearsed it again this morning. Uh, but you can see, and I posted that on Facebook as well as on our Zoom chat, that um, that white leadership was 87% of multiracial churches in 1998, uh, down to 70% now. It was 74% in 2012 and 83% in 2007. So again, moving in the right direction. Uh, I love what Michael Emerson said about the movement because really at the root is systemic change in the American church, just like you've talked about, uh, Michelle and Ephraim and all of us understand. Uh, but what, what's at the root of that is, uh, is understanding that in what Michael said is how it's almost like we are 18 years old if you, as a movement, if you will. So, you know, he, he compared it to this, this childlike, right? So we've grown, there's growth and there's development, but just like any kid transitioning 16, 18, you've come a long way but you have maturity to go. And we need to continue to lean into structural change in the American church, not, uh, not looking back and saying, oh, how bad it is now, but saying, hey, there's been growth, there's been development. We see maturity, we see churches getting more on board in this. Yes, we see some of the complexities and people that are seeing it and using it or trying to use it as a church growth strategy in a trendy way. 
uh, to use that word. But on the other hand, uh, we're not there yet, but we've certainly come a long way and we need to continue to encourage all of us. I know these folks do, but I'm talking to all of us listening, continue to pursue systemic change in the American church for the sake of advancing a credible gospel in an increasingly diverse society. So with all that said, let's go around. I want to give each one of you uh, opportunity, final words, final thoughts. What haven't we said, right? We're always thinking about who's not at the table. What haven't we said? And also maybe one or two specific resources that you might recommend. Harry talked about books earlier. It could be uh, other things, a movie, a film. Uh, maybe it's a blog post, but let's give you a final word, each of you, and also one or two resources or anything else you'd like to add that would be helpful for people to move beyond problems and understanding the complexities to actually implementing solutions that would lead to real change. So Ray, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I know this has been such a rich conversation. I do wanna say a few things. Uh, in terms of the, the multi-ethnic churches, I, I, I love the combination of quantitative data and qualitative data. And I would love to see what the qualitative data is because I wonder if the rise in multi-ethnic churches and, and the people of color that are assuming these roles in multi-ethnic churches, especially ones that are predominantly white, are those who have checked their ethnic distinctions at their door, their culture at the door, so that they're essentially assimilated fully into kind of uh, a, a white framework of thinking or a white logic, and that's why they've been given the the, the, the role of the senior pastor or whatnot, uh, because I do think that there has been a lot of people that have assimilated to the point of erasure that they end up perpetuating more harm to their own communities that they, they are coming from, uh, despite even holding the same theological convictions as, as everyone else within the church. Um, you know, earlier, one of the things that we did talk about, and I, I didn't get to get to it because I was just so excited about the conversation we were having. Uh, the reason I wrote that article on the Asian American Christian Collaborative website um, about being upstream and downstream was because there were a lot of systemic realities that affected the ways that black and brown communities currently are experiencing a disproportionate number of deaths due to COVID-19. And it's all rooted in systemic racism that hasn't been addressed and that people have just been, as everyone has been talking about, silent on. And so it would be great to see Asian Americans at least speak up in, in, into these issues more and then find ways to practically and tangibly help uh, these black, these, these uh, our black and brown uh, community members, our friends and our neighbors and brothers and sisters in Christ uh, mm -hmm. and fellow image bearers. All right, and then, um, and then around some of the conversations that are so polarized, I do wonder if one of the things that we need to do is just take a page out of the book of the Bible, um, uh, take a page out of the Bible and then just self-isolate for 40 days where it's possible. And those who have means really cover the needs of our friends where it's needed. Uh, because if we had just taken this virus seriously 40 days ago, we would be in a far different place now instead of people just choosing to go out you know, on the beaches in Florida or protest their uh, governor's mansions because they think that this is an infringement on their individual rights, which comes at a cost to the collective and collective good. And, and there are people that are actually minimizing the impact of a virus that we still don't have a vaccine for that is a lot of times asymptomatic and is clearly impacting the most vulnerable communities within our society, including the elderly, uh, those who are already immunocompromised, those who are poor, who don't have access to the same type of health care, and then, of course, as we've been seeing, uh, African American and Latino communities. Um, in terms of resources, um, I think, you know, anything by Erica Lee, uh, Gary Okira, uh, and, and Ellen Wu are fantastic books to, to read. Um, Erica Lee writes uh, Asians for Americans, or America, America for Americans, and then the history of, uh, or the making of Asian America. Uh, Ellen Wu has a book on the uh, color of success. Uh, and then, you know, like, Gary O'Kira is a pro prolific author and a, and a historian. So, so look through their, their research uh, resources around Asian American history and Asian American issues. And then the, our website, again, Asian American Christian Collaborative has a bunch of other book, res uh, book recommendations that you can look at. Oh, you're uh, muted. Yeah, there oh, no. you go. Michelle Ephraim, oh. someone else. Yeah, I just wanted to add one uh, comment and one encouragement. I think um, it's very important for people to understand the proper definition of racism, because I think sometimes people see it as any racial prejudice. It's important to understand that racism isn't 
isn't merely just that. It's any prejudice against a person in which it's reinforced by a system of power. And John mentioned that too. This is, this is why we have to look at the systemic issue. And I think oftentimes we reduce the issue of racism down to a battle for the hearts and minds of individual peoples. And mm. I'm not saying that it's wrong to have a conversation with your neighbor or your coworker or your, your a relative um, and, and say, hey, you know, what you said to me was hurtful. And, and those can be helpful conversations because, you know, we want to be able to, to have uh, productive relationships with the people in their lives. But um, that alone won't do anything to combat systemic tropes like in this cultural current cultural moment with racism that won't do anything to confront um tropes of yellow peril at institutional levels within pop culture um that portray asians their foods and their customs as unsafe and unwelcome in our in our country and and tropes that negatively impact whole ways of lives for asian americans and so um when we see racism online or in person, we shouldn't just confront it by thinking, wow, what a horrible person and, and, and you know, try to convince this person to, to say something differently, but you know, raise awareness to how these types of comments or behaviors um, you know, discriminate against you know, businesses and enterprises and, 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 and cause a mental health uh, you know, problems and 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 e even threats to people's lives and so um i i mentioned that one because we need to have proper definitions of racism but i think also too as an encouragement to fellow people of color both um within the asian and asian american community and beyond um this this can be um hopefully an encouragement that you don't have to fight every single racist in your life right because i think we, we, we feel that every time we see something happen or we experience it, we're like, what, what do we say? What do we do? How do I combat this? And I think there can also be this um, encouragement, guard your heart. You don't have to battle every single person that says or does something horrible against people of color. Um, and, and don't fight the person, fight the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't fight the person, fight the system. What a great, uh, great, great word. Ephraim, what about you? kind of final words, any resources? Michelle, did you give some resources, by the way? Oh, um, yeah, so to add to Ray's, uh, Kathy Park Hong's um, Minor Feelings in Asian American Reckoning that just came out this past February, that is a fantastic resource. That chronicles um, the collective Asian American experience of racism in our country uh, throughout the centuries. And then also, Ijeoma Oluo, So You Want to Talk About Race. That's a very uh, helpful book in training people how to have conversations about race and racism. Mm, wonderful. Thank you so much. And I know that resources are available at the Asian American Christian Collaborative, and we'll try to put some out on the YouTube channel with this as well. Ephraim, what about you? Final words, resources, thoughts? Uh, I'll um, center my thoughts in my experience pastoring multi-ethnic congregations and serving in executive leadership of organizations that the work in the mission was targeted towards uh, communities of color in uh, the urban context, but funded by predominantly white evangelical upper class uh, people. So one, uh, I, I wanna say that it's an important for my white brothers and sisters to hear this. If you're a, a white pastor that desires your church to become multi-ethnic. You desire, you, you feel this passion to plant or revitalize your congregation to become multi-ethnic. I would encourage you to have your own conversion in the area of reconciliation and justice and multi-ethnicity first. Let God uh, change. I mean, you see in the Bible that um, God did something significant in the life of Peter. Like, to, to, for Peter to have credibility uh, to be a reconciler in the New Testament, first, uh, God had to give him a vision and make him eat like some reptile sandwiches and hoagies and submarine sandwiches. And then he had to go to Cornelius's house. And from that personal, deep mm. transformation, it gave him the credibility to minister to Jews and Gentiles. And so I just think you, you it, it, and I can go beyond my white uh, brothers and sisters. If 
If you desire to pastor, lead a multi-ethnic ministry, let the conversion, the transformation happen in you. And from that posture of humility and transformation, serve ministries, churches that look like heaven and can transform a diverse yet deeply divided mission field. The other thing is I would say to those that are writing checks uh, to these ventures, again, you need a second conversion. You need God to do something deep in you. Uh, if, if you're giving to uh, projects, initiatives targeted towards people of color, but people of color don't have any kind of authoritative mentoring, coaching, uh, tutoring role in your life, your check alone could do a disservice because that check could be accompanied with ideologies and philosophies and theologies that are more hurtful to the groups that you're trying to financially resource. And so I just think it's important for us all to get on the road to reconciliation. And that leads to the resources that I'll recommend. Brenda Salter McNeil, Roadmap to Reconciliation is Gold. She talks about when there's a catalytic event you can either choose preservation or you can choose transformation. She has a new book out called Be Brave because we need the courage to do this work. Mm -hmm. uh, and then anything by Sung Chan Ra, oh, oh my goodness. You know, I hope when these people come on here and speak, they mention the five books I wrote because it would be yeah. presumptuous of me <laughs> to mention my own books. <laughs> oh, that's great. I will uh, say this from Smith. I uh, I read your dissertation last night. It was fantastic. <laughs> the rise of the reconcilers. Really good stuff. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully a publishing company that's listening will give me a call about that. Yes. yes. Hey, I, there I, you go. Well, we're going to finish up. It's so good. All rich. Nancy Short, God transforms hearts with the gospel of love and agenda that can transform systemic injustice. Uh, Ewan, thanks for watching. David Park's been very active on Facebook. Uh, many others who can't even get to everybody of them. Sandra Knight-Smith, she knows you, Ephraim, right? Ephraim, watching and join the conversation. Lakeisha Connor-Clemens has been with us as well. Sebastian Holly sanchez Bear, thank you all so much. In fact, David Park says Michael Emerson is our Dr. Fauci for the movement. <laughs> so he said he's our Dr. Fauci. I love that. I love that comment. And real quick, you know, on the multi-ethnic church, obviously I'm a very much an optimist. I'm all, you know, when you, as we all know, to promote and to, to actually drive systemic change, in part, you're pointing out and you're critiquing, but you can't just critique. You also have to point and promote and, and with optimism, lead people through faith, courage, and sacrifice uh, to a better future, right? And it's a both and, and the tension is there. And some people are quick in the moment. I think in the last number of years, people just awakening to multi-ethnic churches to start from where they are and critique. Uh, but at the same time, there's been such tremendous progress. Going back to the 80s with Pete Scazzaro and, and Ken Hutcherson and, and so many others that paved a trail. And then over the past 20 years from divided by faith to where we are today, tremendous growth and movement in terms of understanding. But like we were talking about earlier, still a long ways to go in terms of maturity. So it's a both and we want to be critique and we want to see where we're at. But we also want to point to a positive future as all of you do. And even Michelle, you guys starting that new church in Austin, I got to get down there and see it, uh, the work that you and your husband are doing. So let's finish up. Josh, a word, John Richards, and then we'll be out. Harry, we're going to ask you to pray in just a moment. Stick with us for a couple more thoughts, final thoughts, any resources you might say, Josh, and then John. You know what? I, I think that there are probably three resources that I would recommend, right? And I think they speak to my final conclusion. And the first one would be Tasha Morrison's book, Be the Bridge. I think it's important for us to build bridges of trust that can stand up to the weight of truth. And, uh, and I think she does a great job of outlining a pathway for reconciliation. Uh, secondly, Dr. Sung Chan Ra, you can't go wrong with anything that brother writes. Um, cultural intelligence, I think it's something that's a must read for, for everyone is who I'd like to read it. Uh, but for sure for church leaders, those that are in the nonprofit space so that we can engage in a competent way across cultural lines because that's so important. And then finally, Color of Compromise, Jamar Tisby. Uh, just, just this book alone will help you to understand the invention of, of race and white supremacy and how systems of racism work. 
uh, and how we, we came to develop those things and be submissive to them. And I think it's a must read for anybody who's in the, the race space. Mm, excellent. Yeah, Sung Cha has done so much over the past 25 years or more. Just outstanding writing, outstanding thinker, a good friend. Appreciate you bringing him up. John, final thought, final word, and then we'll go to Harry for prayer. Yeah, I think ultimately this conversation is a symptom of a larger problem uh, that we've seen in America from its inception, and that is the dogged pursuit of whiteness in America or making white normative in America. Um, going to seminary, all my books I read were by white men. Uh, most of the other books on the recommended reading list were from some of the people that we're mentioning here. So um, I would say that it's going to take some deconstruction of that normative uh, narrative that we have and then reconstructing it by influencing or actually infusing it with a narrative that includes everyone. So my resource, uh, and I'm a history buff, my resource would be uh, Ronald Takaki's A Different Mirror. Uh, he's a historian out in California, passed away uh, last year, I think, somewhere around that time. Uh, but he wrote a history of America that actually really points out just how similar our experiences are. Uh, he talks about Italian Americans and how coming over that they were actually considered in the same class as African Americans so they pursued whiteness as a response. So um, for us to recognize and realize that our experiences here um, actually aren't all that different, although some were treated much more worse, I think that's gonna be super helpful. So I think Ronald Takaki's book, A Different Mirror, would be a good starting point for someone who wants to understand history as we're probably not taught in primary school or high school or in our colleges. Mm. Well, someone asked uh, about, could we post these resources? I'm going to ask all of our, our guests today. Uh, we obviously know one another and we can uh, chat by text, but I, if you would uh, send me the two or three things, links, whatever, we're going to post that uh, here within the next 24 hours. We'll take this conversation. We'll uh, uh, put it out on YouTube, on our Facebook channel, or our YouTube channel, and within the next 24 hours. And then on that, you know, you can write a description. So we'll list those resources from all our, uh, pan, our, our, our guests today, they'll be on that YouTube channel. And again, there's resources on the Asian American uh, Christian Collaborative page as well. So I wanna thank you, each one of you, this, man, to get as much in as we did in an hour and a half is amazing. You all are such wonderful thinkers and, and activists and, and really rooted in scripture. You know, We didn't talk a lot today about scripture, uh, Ephraim bringing in Cornelius and all that. We talked about how Michelle Justice is peri uh, intrinsic to the gospel, not peripheral. Uh, I just want anybody to know watching, seeing this, each one of these people, including myself, we are strongly rooted in, in biblical theology, exegesis. This, is, this isn't about political correctness. This isn't so much about changing demographics. This is ultimately rooted in strong theology for the sake of advancing a credible gospel uh, in an increasingly diverse society for the sake of the gospel creating healthy systems, structures, equity. Uh, unity is equity, right, on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, the ground is level at the foot of the cross, and it's long past time for us to begin living like that in our own daily interactions, our lives, our relationships, and, of course, in our churches. So I just want to be really clear with all our guests. I know them. They know me. We are all, everything we've said is rooted in robust scripture, and whether it's uh, Ephraim's writing, my own writing, others in their blogs, the books, you'll see that when you dive deeper into uh, who we are and what we're about. So I want to thank each and every one of you, Michelle, Ray, John, Ephraim, Josh just uh, jumped out, but thank you so much for your time uh, today, but more importantly, for who you are, for your heart, uh, for the investment of your lives in trying to bring more justice to this world on behalf of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. Make sure you send me those resources. And Harry, uh, what you may not know, as I do, Harry, of course, we've been together 18 years. He is the lead pastor, the senior pastor here at Mosaic Church. And uh, we are what we believe, not a perfect, but a healthy multi-ethnic church, right? Uh, structurally, and Harry's our leader. Uh, talk about quality, Ray. Uh, that is certainly true here. Uh, but what I want you to know is Harry uh, is a man of, of deep prayer and of deep faith. And when Harry prays and prays for you, uh, it's not so much an honor and privilege. It's just something that accomplishes much in the heavenly places. So Harry, would you take us out in prayer and pray for our time together for the discussion uh, for these, uh, our guests that have joined us today and, and that God would 
help us advance on these things uh, in the future. Absolutely. Let's pray together. Lord, we do come together and we acknowledge this is a sin issue. At the deepest core, it just shows that man has a sin nature and it shows itself every time there's pressure and stress and sickness, there's just trial and tribulations. It comes out in so many ways. And I pray especially for this group of brothers and sisters. I'm so thankful for every one of them and their heart for the kingdom. And I pray especially that you would give them perseverance. This is such a tiring battle and it wears on us. And we sometimes just get so tired of having to be the one to beat the drum and to constantly push the edges so that people will listen. But we also know, honestly, we're just getting started. You are just beginning to work deeply in the hearts of so many around the country and that we would continue to persevere. We would continue to have faith, continue to hope and trust for a better day, continue to live in the power of the Holy Spirit to keep influencing as many men and women, brothers and sisters, believers and non-believers alike about this issue because it is your issue. It is the heart of who you are and the heart of why you came. And so would you continue to give us that strength day by day, hour by hour, to keep pressing on. I pray that you would bless every one of these panelists with uh, an extraordinary spring in their step today, just full of joy, knowing that they're fulfilling the calling that you've given them, knowing that there's great grace on struggles such as this, that they can sleep well at night and wake up tomorrow even more excited to continue on. And we thank you for the trials and the struggles that come along with it and the process of building unity around all these issues. Would you particularly bless Ray as he unifies this around so many different issues where you are glorified, you are lifted up, and there's so many minds and so many hearts thinking so differently from different experiences. Would you give them supernatural wisdom and discernment on how to unify such a broad group of a slice of heaven. We're all going to be in, around the cross worshiping you forever. So just give them the ability, God, supernaturally to find ways to unify us more and more. And we thank you. Thank you for this rich, rich discussion. I think you are greatly glorified from it. Bless all those listening. May they be encouraged. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.